When Clark first kindly invited me to give a talk today, I thought King George III might have been rather amused at the prospect of us gathering in the shadow of the White House to chat about the British monarchy 245 years after the start of the American Revolution. It was then he declared Americans to be traitors to the crown if they took up arms against royal authority. While the royals no longer command any authority on this side of the pond, they do continue to captivate. A few of my more cynical colleagues in the news business have a tendency to question why anyone still cares, but they perhaps underestimate the Queen's global reach. She's head of state to 16 nations known as the Commonwealth Realms, and she's head of the Commonwealth of Nations, encompassing more than 2 billion citizens. Fair to say, a lot of people care. But though the US is neither a realm nor a member of the Commonwealth, still Britain and America enjoy a very special relationship, a phrase coined by Sir Winston Churchill during a speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri in 1946. President Trump's first working visit to the UK in 2018 was a testament to civility on both sides. Much was made of him being late to Windsor Castle where he was due to meet the Queen. He wasn't, nor was it out of line for him not to bow. Foreign heads of state don't bow or curtsy to each other. But while there was a bit of a muddle when it came to inspecting the guards, still the Queen's tea with the President and First Lady ran over by a good 15 minutes, confirming no offence had been taken. The President's trip had resulted in widespread protests, and it was up to the Queen to make him feel welcome. That she did. The Queen has actually shared a warm relationship with a number of US presidents. In June 1982, President Reagan and his wife Nancy embarked on an official visit to the UK. They were invited to stay with the Queen at Windsor Castle, becoming the first presidential couple to do so. The following year, the Queen and Prince Philip paid a 10-day visit to the US, during which time the Reagans hosted them at their ranch in Santa Barbara, California perhaps bonded over their mutual love of horses, the Queen conferred an honorary knighthood on the former president, naming him an honorary knight Grand Cross of the Most Honourable Order of the Bath in 1989. Granted, it's a bit of a mouthful for everyday use, but it's the highest honour afforded to foreign citizens. Reagan was one of only three presidents to be awarded the knighthood, the other two being Eisenhower and George H. W. Bush. President Trump did not receive the same honour, but his state visit to the UK the following summer did ensure his membership to a rather exclusive club. Other than Lyndon B. Johnson, the Queen has met every US president to have held office since her accession in 1952. She met Truman while still Princess Elizabeth. Eisenhower visited the Queen at Balmoral in 59. The Kennedys dined with her and Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace in 61, and George Bush Sr., along with his wife Barbara, lunched with the Queen and Prince Philip in Edinburgh in 1989. But only two other US presidents have been awarded a full state visit, George W. Bush in 2003 and Barack Obama in 2011. Throughout her tenure, the Queen has, at the request of her government, played host to numerous political heroes and villains. Government officials are charged with haggling over policy. The Queen is required to lay on the charm through soft diplomacy. But as one might expect, some guests have been a little more challenging than others. Prior to Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu's state visit in 1978, all the guest rooms at Buckingham Palace were cleared of valuables. Royal aides had been warned his entourage would likely depart with a few more items than they arrived with. The Queen put on an excellent show for her controversial guest, but in private, she went out of her way to avoid him. While walking her dogs in the palace gardens, she spotted Ceausescu and his wife Elena heading in her direction. As she told a lunch guest some years later, she decided the best course of action was to hide in the bushes rather than try to conduct polite conversation. The Queen, of course, is well versed in coping with tricky situations, and this year in particular has certainly proved her mettle. Prince Andrew continues to face accusations of not helping the FBI with their investigation into the allegations surrounding the late Jeffrey Epstein. Zara Tyndall, the Queen's granddaughter, was banned from driving for six months after being caught speeding. Her mother, Princess Anne, was banned for the same offence in 1990. Two separate family members declared their intention to divorce. Prince Charles fell victim to coronavirus and the Queen's been forced to spend months in isolation, effectively putting a stop to the majority of her commitments. 
But it all kicked off quite unexpectedly on January 8th, when Harry and Meghan announced their decision to quit royal life. They did so without giving the Queen any prior warning. Pushed into rush negotiations, the Queen urged palace officials to find a speedy resolution. But in lieu of a what to do when family members choose to quit manual, there was much to consider. After addressing the most pressing issues, namely titles, finances and use of the word royal, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex officially stepped down from their working life on March 31st. Given there was no precedent for such a mood, move and in light of the enormity of their decision, the Queen requested a 12-month review set to take place next April. She did so in case the couple decide they want back in. But having paid back the money owed on Frogmore Cottage, their home in Windsor, and clearly very settled in their new Montecito mansion, it's looking increasingly unlikely. Before the Sussexes left, it was widely known they were unhappy. The royal family, reporters, and those who closely follow all things relating to the monarchy knew drastic measures were in order if they were going to be able to continue. But I don't think anyone could have predicted them throwing in the towel in quite such a dramatic fashion. Harry was raised in an environment in which duty was drummed into him. Diana had her own struggles with life as a royal, but fundamentally she believed in the monarchy and she respected both the institution and the Queen enormously. It was vitally important to Diana that her boys appreciate just how fortunate they were and their royal training started early. Once they were old enough, she took them out at night to meet people sleeping rough on the streets. She did so quietly, without fanfare, and without the press present. She wanted them to know that with great privilege comes great responsibility. Both boys also benefited from a close relationship with their grandparents. All the Queen's grandchildren have spoken fondly of the role their grandparents have played in their lives, and they've expressed awe over their commitment to the institution they've served for going on 70 years. Where the Queen and Prince Philip are concerned, duty comes above all else. Generally speaking, we really only see the formal side to royal life, and as such, the interactions we witness between family members tend to smack of formality too. But behind the scenes, the Windsors are actually very close. Yes, they have to make appointments to see each other, but that's because they march to the beat of very full diaries. Those who spend time around them are routinely surprised to find they're very fond of each other. And they also share a wicked sense of humor, one that really comes into its own at Christmas. Very little emphasis is put on fancy presents for the Windsors. Instead, there's a bit of friendly competition as they try to outdo each other with gag gifts. Princess Anne once gifted Charles with a white leather loose seat. I'm not kidding. Pre-Meghan, Kate gifted Harry a grow your own girlfriend kit and Harry once gave the Queen a shower cap that read, ain't lifer, to coin a Barbara Bush phrase, it rhymes with rich. The truth is they, like anyone, love a good laugh and they especially like it when things go wrong on official engagements. Uncontrollable snafus break up the monotony of what can, on occasion, be a string of rather mundane activities conducted amidst freshly painted walls and newly mown grass. And there's always room for a surprise from the royals themselves. Prince Charles has presented the weather. William and Kate don't grass skirts for a traditional dance in Tuvalu, and Prince Harry once challenged, challenged legendary sprinter Usain Bolt to a race, one he won, but only because he cheated. Little did anyone anticipate the surprise that was to come in 2012, however, when the country watched a gog, as the Queen took part in a skit with James Bond for the opening ceremony of the London Olympics. According to her dresser, Angela Kelly, it was the Queen who insisted on having a line. I was in London at the time, and I remember watching the ceremony unfold with friends. As Bond walked into the Queen's sitting room, it felt as though the entire country collectively moved an inch closer to their television sets. We were all thinking the same thing. It's not the real Queen, it couldn't be the real Queen. But when she turned around, the nation erupted. She won kudos in spades. In that moment, she was one of us. And it was one of the first real moments Brits got to witness a lighter side to a woman usually seen as more formal and reserved. Truth be told, the Queen's actually a bit of a closet actress. 
As a child living out the war years at Windsor Castle, she and her late sister, Princess Margaret, took part in a number of Christmas shows for those living and working within castle grounds. From 1941 to 44, they staged Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Aladdin, and Old Mother Red Riding Boots to raise money for the Queen's Wool Fund. When it comes to professional theatre, however, the Queen loves a musical. Oklahoma is one of her favourites. But given her predetermined destiny, a life treading the boards was never to be. In 2016, the Queen exercised her acting chops once again during another unforgettable cameo. You may remember when she appeared in a video alongside Prince Harry to promote his Invictus Games. In the clip, subsequently sent to the Obamas, Harry famously dropped the mic before saying boom. It was a great moment, but more importantly, I think it spoke to the camaraderie that exists between our two countries, as well as the warm relationship shared between the Queen and Prince Harry. A formal family? Yes, but one in which the key players are more than happy to poke fun at themselves. Stepping away from his family, from all he's ever known to embrace life as a civilian, will not have been an easy decision for Prince Harry, and there's no question life in the US will be a hard adjustment. It's been eight months since he was last in England. That's the longest amount of time he's ever spent away from home. When looking for someone to blame, as some have, it's easy to, to, to assume as the last one in, this is all Meghan's fault. But long before meeting his wife, Harry repeatedly talked of the difficulties he faced as a public figure. He has a natural charm. Like his mother, he's able to interact easily with people from all walks of life. And he's totally committed to the causes he believes in but he's also deeply conflicted. He loathes the press, finds the obsession with his private life stifling, and at times he's found it hard to play second fiddle to his brother who will one day be king. Perhaps falling in love and having the support of a devoted wife gave him the courage he needed to kiss goodbye to the family business. Many have inevitably compared the Sussex's departure to the abdication crisis of 1936, when Edward VIII gave up the throne in order to marry twice divorced American socialite Wallace Simpson. But Harry and Meghan's situation is very different. Edward was forced to step down. Harry and Meghan chose to. In 1936, the Church of England didn't recognise divorce. As head of the very same church, it would have been considered unconstitutional for Edward to marry a divorcee. Edward's father, George V, believed it was the royal family's responsibility to set an example and by extension for them to champion strict family values. In doing so, he expected them to live to a higher standard than us regular folk. But Edward had other ideas. He was a party prince, a ladies man, and one who cared little for duty. So appalled was he by his son's behaviour, George even predicted Edward's eventual downfall. In a letter to British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, George wrote, after I'm dead, the boy will ruin himself within 12 months. Edward reigned for only 325 days. Of course, the royals do in fact represent as imperfect a family as any other. But in 1936, there were very valid fears that should Edward marry Mrs. Simpson, it would irreparably damage the monarchy. The church couldn't afford for members of the public to assume that if divorce and remarriage were good enough for the king, the same rules would apply to everyone else. Yet here we are, 84 years later, and Britain's king in waiting is a divorced man who just so happens to be married to a divorcee. Harry and Meghan's bombshell announcement came less than 20 months after their spectacular wedding held at St George's Chapel, Windsor in May 2018. I was there that day covering the event for CNN and the excitement in the air was palpable. Granted, there were tents serving pims which had been set up along the length of the long walk. Brits will never say no to lying in the sun with an alcoholic beverage in hand. But the day represented way more than an excuse to cut loose in the Queen's back garden. A member of the British royal family was marrying a divorced American actress who also happened to be biracial. Ten, even five years ago, just one of those elements would have been enough to constitute a royal thumbs down. Charles, Andrew and Edward had all previously dated actresses. All were told they would not make suitable royal brides. But finally, the royal family was being catapulted into the 21st century with the arrival of one Meghan Markle. Britons were proud, Americans were ecstatic, and it cannot be underestimated how significant it was for people around the Commonwealth to finally see themselves reflected in the British royal family. 
a person of color had been warmly welcomed into what had long been considered a white Anglo-Christian institution. And she'd been welcomed amidst, amidst much pomp and pageantry for all the world to see. Marrying into a family steeped in over a thousand years of custom and tradition is no mean feat. And it would be impossible for any newbie to fully comprehend just how challenging life is within the royal fishbowl, especially someone like Meghan, who's led an independently successful pre-royal existence. Suddenly, you're not allowed an opinion. Politics are off limits, privacy virtually non-existent, and the days of nipping off to Rome for a spontaneous long weekend are long gone. But alongside personal sacrifice, so too comes enormous privilege a global platform on which to champion charitable causes, access to change makers, church leaders, and international heads of state. Then there are the more materialistic advantages, nice homes, spectacular jewels, and a killer wardrobe. People on the outside will often say, where do I sign? But it's a life afforded on the taxpayer dime, which means no matter how good the work, how committed the individual, the royals will more often than not find themselves damned by press and public alike. In January 1997, just a few months before her tragic death, Diana, Princess of Wales, traveled to Angola with the Halo Trust to learn more about the landmines crisis. By that stage, she and Charles had been divorced for five months. She'd stepped back from a number of her patronages, and she was redefining her role by taking on what some argued were politically charged causes. Diana understood the power of her celebrity. In the 80s, she'd single-handedly changed people's attitudes towards HIV AIDS when she shook hands with an AIDS patient without wearing gloves. And her work on behalf of the homeless was groundbreaking. She knew the trip to Angola would be considered controversial, but she also knew it would generate a huge amount of publicity. She was taking a gamble, but off she went, and the world's press duly followed. To this day, there are few images more iconic than the one of Diana sitting alongside a young amputee girl, or the photo of her decked out in full body armor walking through an active minefield. By the mid 90s, the landmine crisis had been declared an epidemic. Hundreds of people were losing their lives daily. Given the attention she commanded, Diana knew she could make a difference, but still she was labelled a loose cannon by Earl Howe, the UK's then junior defence minister, who also said she was uninformed about the issue. Peter Vigors, a Tory member of the Defence Select Committee, added his two cents, saying the government's policy on this had been an extremely careful one, and the statements made by the Princess of Wales have not been in line with that policy. Diana's response, I'm not a political figure, my interests are humanitarian. It was a classic case of a royal trying to walk the delicate royal political divide. She knew she'd be criticised, that goes with the territory, but she went anyway. And it's a good job she did. Her visit has since been credited as a major turning point in the effort to ban landmines, and her involvement represents a positive lasting legacy. Last November, during his own trip to Angola, Prince Harry retraced his mother's footsteps. Today, the landmine field made famous by her walk is a bustling street in the town of Huambo. A tree dubbed the Diana tree marks the spot where she was photographed in 1997. Inevitably, since marrying into the royal family, Meghan has routinely been compared to her late mother-in-law, and there are some parallels. Meghan is a fashion house dream. Interest in her every move has been insatiable, and she's shown total commitment to her causes. She's been keen to do things her own way, and she's had to contend with a zealous tabloid press. In her day, Diana couldn't go anywhere without being hounded by the media, whether at the gym, out to lunch, or on holiday. Hordes of photographers followed. On occasion, she encouraged them by tipping them off as to where she would be, but she quickly learned that once you let them in, it's very hard to shut them out again. After her death, strict new measures were adopted so as to prevent paparazzos from employing their nasty tactics. As a result, Meghan has not had to endure the same physical invasion of privacy, but she has had to deal with a voracious online media, racial slurs, and appalling commentary from social media trolls. The Duchess's royal career, as it happens, got off to an excellent start. She was greeted by enthusiastic crowds at pretty much every engagement. She launched a charity cookbook in order to raise funds for victims of the Grenfell Tower fire. 
she guest edited the September 2019 British edition of Vogue, which went on to become the fastest selling issue in the magazine's 128 year history. And she lent her support to a clothing collection for which the retailers involved donated an item of clothing for each one purchased to Smartworks, an organization providing women with access to professional attire for job interviews. As a couple, the Sussexes embarked on tours to Northern Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Tonga, Morocco, and South Africa. And in the middle of all of it, they welcomed their first child, Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor. By anyone's standards, it would have been a lot. And in the end, the schedule, as well as a rabid global press, resulted in the Duchess confessing to British journalist Tom Bradby that she was existing, not living. Harry and Meghan's departure will have been keenly felt by the royal family, and they do leave behind an irreplaceable void. But unlike Edward and Mrs. Simpson, they begin their new lives with the Queen's blessing, and the royal door has been left open for them to return at any time. Among her many responsibilities, the Queen is charged with protecting the institution of monarchy, but it can be a thankless task when acting as head of state, mummy, and granny. Still, she found a workable solution to the Sussexes' wishes, and while she's been criticised by some, she has granted them the freedom they crave. Perhaps it's the wisdom of her years. Perhaps it's because she witnessed firsthand the toll royal life took on her father. Regardless, she set aside self in order to meet the needs of her family. Her sense of duty is what really defines her in the eyes of many as Britain's greatest sovereign. Monarchists and Republicans alike are united in their deep-rooted affection for the Queen. Even Scottish nationalists agree. When they look towards the 2014 referendum on independence, they vowed to keep her as head of state, no matter the vote's outcome. As Britain's head of state for more than 68 years, it will come as little surprise that Queen Elizabeth II has set a multitude of records, many of which will likely never be broken. The longest reigning monarch in British history, having surpassed Queen Victoria's record on September 9th, 2015, she's also the nation's longest lived, as well as the oldest serving sovereign in the world. On a more personal note, come the 20th of this month, she and Prince Philip will mark 73 years of wedded bliss. In 2007, she became the first British monarch to celebrate a diamond wedding anniversary. She's since added a platinum to her plethora of achievements, and a 75th wedding anniversary isn't entirely beyond the realms of possibility. In Philip, the Queen chose a man whose devotion to duty equals her own. He's the longest serving consort in British history, and at 99 years of age, the longest lived male member of the British royal family. He'll celebrate his 100th birthday next June. Aside from her myriad records, the Queen is also a sovereign of many firsts. She was the first British monarch to visit the Vatican, a mosque and a Hindu temple. In 1979, she embarked on her first trip to the Middle East, during which she became the first British monarch first female sovereign and the world's first female head of state to visit Saudi Arabia, a strictly Muslim country where, until 2017, women were forbidden from driving. For the duration of her stay, the Queen and her four ladies-in-waiting were declared honorary men. In 1998, the Queen welcomed former Saudi Arabian King, King Abdullah, then Crown Prince to Balmoral, her Scottish estate in Royal Deeside. After sharing a light lunch, she asked her guest if he'd like a tour of the grounds. Initially hesitant, Abdullah agreed, though he quickly came to regret what proved to be a rather harrowing experience. In an excerpt from his 2003 book, Gerard Kalpakols, a one-time British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, described exactly what went down. The Crown Prince climbed into the front seat of a Land Rover, expecting a chauffeur to escort him around the estate. A few minutes later, it was the Queen who climbed into the driver's seat, turned on the ignition and took off. Now, if you've ever seen photos of the Queen in the driver's seat of a Land Rover, you'll know she doesn't wear a seatbelt and given her height, she can only just see over the top of the steering wheel. Unaccustomed to being driven by a woman, Abdullah's nervousness only increased as the Queen, an army driver during wartime, accelerated along the narrow country roads. He told his translator to ask her to slow down and concentrate on the road ahead, but seemingly oblivious to his discomfort, she kept her foot down while enthusiastically pointing out the sights. Of course, she knows those roads better than anyone, and she's an excellent driver. He never would have been in any danger. 
but though she'd never admit it, I think a subtle point was being made that day. A consummate diplomat, the Queen is always very careful to choose her words wisely, but as she tore through the Scottish Highlands, her actions spoke louder than words. Over the course of her reign, the Queen's visited 116 countries, making her the most widely travelled monarch in British history. Despite close family ties to former Tsars, she was the nation's first reigning sovereign to set foot in Moscow's Red Square. She was the first to step onto Australian soil, the first to open the Canadian Parliament, and the first to visit New Zealand, from where she broadcast her Christmas Day message in December 1953. During her trip to the US in 1991, she became the first British monarch to address a joint meeting of the US Congress in Washington. Her speech, frequently interrupted by fervent applause, thanked Americans for their steadfast loyalty to our common enterprise throughout this turbulent century. With a non-partisan approach, she was able to emphasize the importance of the Allied peacekeeping force. It wasn't until May 2011, however, that she was finally able to visit the Republic of Ireland. The four-day state visit designed to serve as a symbol of friendship and reconciliation was the first by a British sovereign since the bloody struggle for Irish independence during the reign of her grandfather, George V, who last visited in 1911. The trip posed enormous security concerns, but her presence drew broad acclaim from Irish politicians. She wore emerald green, spoke a little Gaelic, and bowed before Dublin's nationalist memorial to those killed in the fight for independence. The Queen's ability to exercise diplomacy even in the most tenuous of circumstances is second to none. Needless to say, her trip was considered a huge success. Robust, fit and healthy, there's every indication the Queen could live to the same age as her mother, who died in 2002 at the age of 101. Should she at least make it another 15 months, she'll become the first British monarch to mark a platinum jubilee, 70 years on the throne. In 2012, I was in London for ABC News covering her diamond jubilee, marking 60 years since her accession. The British media is well known for their rather cynical view of things, and many among the press predicted no one would care and the whole thing would be a damp squib. Damp, it was, rainy, windy, freezing, it was England in June, but undeterred by the weather, the people came. Thousands of flag-waving Brits flocked to London over what was an extraordinary three days. They may be loath to admit it, but the vast majority of my countrymen relish a national occasion, especially one steeped in pageantry and tradition. I appreciate I may be a little biased, but the UK really does put on a spectacular show, and the Jubilee represented a dazzling display of royalty at its finest. The final day also granted us our first concrete vision of the future. As the celebrations came to a rapturous conclusion following a service of thanksgiving at St Paul's Cathedral on June 5th, a select few members of the royal family stepped out onto the balcony at Buckingham Palace to acknowledge the crowds lining the mall below. At times of national celebration, we've come to expect an appearance from the whole Windsor clan squeezed shoulder to shoulder. But as the Queen emerged, flanked only by Charles, Camilla, William, Kate and Harry, Prince Philip was in hospital for the treatment of a bladder infection, the message was clear. They, along with Prince Harry's eventual wife, were the royal faces of the future. Charles has made no secret of his desire for a slimmed down modern monarchy, and his vision has largely been met with widespread approval. Joe Public has grown tired of perceived royal strap hangers, and in order to remain relevant, the remarkably forward thinking Prince of Wales has long recognized the royal family is in dire need of a ceremonial cull. While the plan hasn't resonated well with all members of the family, Charles has remained resolute. With Andrew's fall from grace and Harry and Meghan's recent decision, decision to embrace civilian life far from Britain's shores, the future is looking considerably leaner. Throughout the Queen's reign, a plethora of royals have been on hand to lend their support, from her husband, mother and sister, to her cousins, children, in-laws and grandchildren. There have been royals aplenty to oversee patronages, tours, openings, closings, commemorations and more. But in what has become a rapidly aging lineup, a natural slimming down is on the horizon, quite aside from the one mandated by Charles. On an annual basis, the royals carry out engagements on behalf of the 16 Commonwealth realms. 
the 54 member Commonwealth of Nations, and a huge number of charities and organizations boasting royal connections. They attend in palace events, such as investitures, receptions, dinners, and garden parties. And as events of national and global importance occur, they fan out far and wide in order to represent the queen. Now, down three key figures in a very short amount of time, it's increasingly apparent that as the years progress, the Windsors are going to struggle to meet all their responsibilities. Something's gonna to have to give, but will it be Charles? In terms of who should step up, Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, the daughters of Prince Andrew and his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson seem like the obvious choice. The only blood princesses of their generation, each is privately affiliated with a number of charities, and both have travelled extensively in an effort to promote Brand Britain. Beatrice was the first royal to complete the London Marathon. She's since climbed Mont Blanc, and in 2018 she took part in a half marathon for children in Laos. In 2010, she, along with six of her friends, founded Big Change, a charity aimed at encouraging young people to develop skills outside the traditional academic curriculum. She's spoken often about her battles with dyslexia. And in 2017, she helped promote the anti-bullying book, Be Cool, Be Nice, in response to her own experiences with bullying. As a non-working royal, Eugenie, who's currently pregnant with her first child, has an equally impressive resume, and much like her sister, many of her interests complement the work of the current senior royals. Patron of the European School of Osteopathy, the Teenage Cancer Trust, and Elephant Family, Eugenie also supports an initiative focused on championing the work of female artists. She's involved with a program committed to protecting the world's oceans from plastic pollution. And after discussing ending modern slavery at the Nexus Global Summit at the UN in New York, Eugenie became the patron of Anti-Slavery International. Both princesses also hold down full-time jobs. Whether Beatrice or Eugenie would want to forego their independent lives so as to join the royal ranks, I couldn't say. But on paper, both ladies tick all the requisite royal boxes. Nonetheless, given their parents' propensity for poor choices and attracting worldwide scandal, the girls' future involvement is going to be a very tough sell where Charles is concerned, particularly given the ongoing controversies surrounding their father. Unfair? Perhaps but nothing about life within the royal family could be considered fair. For the time being, the Queen won't be looking to replace Harry and Meghan. It's more important that the dust be allowed to settle while they undergo their period of transition. The initial terms of their resignation will be reviewed in April, at which point there'll be a better understanding of their long-term plans and the subsequent impact on the rest of the family. In the interim, I suspect the Countess of Wessex, Prince Edward's wife, will be the royal most likely to shoulder the extra load. Popular behind palace walls, Sophie shares a close bond with her mother-in-law, and she's known for her can-do attitude and positive approach. As the royal family remains in flux, the coming months represent a critical period for Prince Charles in particular. Although keen to be seen as the great modernizer, whittling the family down to four key figures could be detrimental to the very institution he set to head. Aged 71, he keeps up a staggering schedule, but as king, his time will be dominated by kingly duties. It's fair to say the extended family could take on many of the responsibilities he as monarch simply won't have time for. Question is, will he let them? Ultimately, the decision rests with Charles, but as the monarchy's recent seismic changes have shown, anything can happen. In a highly pressurized environment in which the demands are great, surely it's better to have both family and numbers on side. Life is already quite lonely at the top, Modernity, for the sake of it, may make things even lonelier. It's a new day and a new normal for the Windsors, but it's not, as some have suggested, the beginning of the end. With three kings in waiting, the line of succession is secure. And aged only seven, Prince George could well be the first monarch of the 22nd century. Though some have expressed doubts over Charles' ability to reign, I believe they're greatly underestimating his capabilities. As the longest serving heir apparent in British history, his entire life has been spent in preparation for his eventual destiny. For her part, the Queen will leave behind the single greatest blueprint of any previous monarch. Her accomplishments have been vast, 
but there's still one particularly significant milestone left to achieve. On February 6, 2022, at the age of 95, the Queen will mark 70 years on the throne, becoming the first reigning British monarch to celebrate a platinum jubilee. Known for not lacking a fuss, she'll take it all in her stride, but one can expect Britons to be out in force the following June, as festivities are held across the nation. Last Christmas, a new portrait of the Queen and her three heirs was released to the public, as was a video of her alongside Charles, William and George making a Christmas pudding in their music room at Buckingham Palace. During a televised Christmas Day message, a selection of photos featuring George VI, Charles, Camilla and the Cambridge family were chosen to grace the Queen's desk. They, like the portrait and video, they were there to promote a sense of continuity the goal being to restore confidence in a monarchy badly shaken by Prince Andrew's disastrous interview for the BBC. After a tough year, maintaining public confidence is more crucial than ever. But thanks to the Queen's calm and measured approach to the COVID-19 crisis and her keep calm and carry on spirit, her popularity remains at an all-time high. Just this week, she was voted Britain's most popular royal, followed by William, Kate and Prince Philip. In its thousand year history, the monarchy has survived war, revolution, reformation, abdication, and more. It will arguably survive its recent run of strife too. And regardless of the turmoil unfolding behind the scenes, the show and the queen will go on just as they always have. Thank you. Victoria, that was absolutely superb. Thank you so much, just terrific. Well, well as, you can, as you can imagine, we have lots of questions, so I think we've got time for two or three. Great. So one is the rumors about the rift between Harry and William. What do you make of that? Any truth to that, as near as you can tell? Yes, sadly, there is truth to that. And I, I think it's uh, for a number of reasons. There are the obvious ones, uh, such as Harry and Meghan choosing to leave the royal family and doing so quite unexpectedly. I think William well appreciated that they were unhappy and, and that there needed to be some changes, but none of the royal family anticipated them re releasing the news to the public in the way that they did. So that made things problematic. But I think Harry and William have been res wrestling with a number of issues for a long time one certainly hopes they'll find their way back to each other because at the end of the day they're brothers they are family members hopefully a bit of time and distance will enable them to repair that relationship and, and really be able to come back together you ended by talking about your sense that the monarchy is likely to endure and it seems based on what you've said that both charles and william after him are poised to assume the mantle of leadership but as near as you can envisage, do you see the monarchy surviving 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Yes, I do. Now, call me an optimist. I am a, a monarchist. I am a royalist, uh, <laughs> admittedly so. But as, as we mentioned there, Clark, the, the royal family has survived so much. And the recent uh, run of problems, of course, each, each one is a problem in and of itself. The royal family is a business first and foremost. And, and so there are going to be highs. There are going to be lows. But I think ultimately, if you were to put it to the British public that the royal family would be no more, I don't think they would accept that just yet. Now, it's possible that's because there is such a deep-rooted affection for the Queen. But while I, I'm loath to talk about the day she's not here anymore, I think sympathy over her loss will certainly uh, propel optimism around Prince Charles. Um, and then it really will be up to Charles to secure the people's affection. He's certainly not going to have as long to leave a legacy in, in the way his mother has, but I don't think Charles should be underestimated. He's a remarkable man, incredibly forward thinking, and I think we need to give him a chance. You touched on the Queen's relationship over the years, her long reign with a number of American presidents. Which one would you say was her favorite? Uh, the Queen is pretty loath to, to admit to favourites, but I think if we were to go with the personal elements of life, I think she was very fond of Ronald Reagan. Uh, quite aside from him being a president, he was an actor, she loves acting, and he loved horses. And they really shared a, a lot in common when it came to horses. He, he bred race horses as well. So I think there was a lot there that they could really discuss that was personal to both of them. So I think the Queen enjoyed every trip she's taken to America. She's 
certainly enjoyed hosting the presidents in the UK as well. But um, she wouldn't pick a favorite, but if I'm picking one on her behalf, I would go with Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and what about the Queen's relationship with Princess Diana? Much was made of that at the time. I'm so glad you ask about this, Clark, because it's amazing how myths become fact over time. The Queen was actually very fond of Diana, and I think she tried really hard to make things work for her. Um, Diana being lost the way she was at such a young age in such tragic circumstances, there's a tendency to absolve her of any fault in terms of the role she played in her breakdown of her relationship with the royal family. But I think the Queen respected her enormously and the way we really saw that was on Diana, the day of Diana's funeral, as the funeral procession passed, the Queen bowed her head to Diana, the Queen does not bow to anybody. And I think that really spoke volumes about how fond she was of Diana, how devastated she was by her death. Um, and certainly behind the scenes, she did everything she could to help. But there's a point where, when the two key figures, namely Charles and Diana, are not prepared to help, you're kind of at a loss. She did what she could. And final question, of course, we're all dealing with a pandemic and I see that uh... Great Britain is in lockdown now for the Prime Minister's announcement the other day. Yeah. Many people have commented on the address that the Queen made, um, which was very reminiscent of her, her role in World War II and her remarks then. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the address was phenomenal. Uh, and a lot of people have complained, why didn't she talk earlier? Well, the Queen doesn't get to choose when she makes a televised address. Uh, she's very much beholden to the government and the Prime Minister would have been advising her on when was the appropriate time to address the British public. She did so on Sunday, April 5th. And I think they thought it was the right time to do that because that's when I think we really started to get a handle on just how catastrophic this crisis was. And she needed to be there to reassure the British public. And I think it's extraordinary. It goes back to one of the earlier questions, Clark. Who would think that, a, and she was 93 then, a 93-year-old lady coming on television and invoking um, that sort of wartime spirit would have such a profound effect? But it did. She was widely praised by monarchists and Republicans alike. And I think what the Queen offers 68 years on the throne is a sense of continuity and measured calm. And I think her speech that day was just very reassuring. People needed to see her. Of course, she'd been put in isolation, in lockdown, so no one had seen her. So they wanted to know she was OK. But her words, the way she addressed everybody, there was, there was no exaggeration, no hyperbole. It was just gentle, calm, measured, and I think it really boosted everyone's sense of resilience.